kind of a, a strange holiday, isn't it? That, uh, you know why. <coughs> it's not one of the main holidays. Relatives don't show up. There's no turkey to eat. There's no presents to unwrap. And we call it Labor Day, though we try to do as little labor as possible. Most folks have the day off. No one sends Labor Day cards. Did you get a Labor Day card in the mail? Me either. Me either. We don't give corsages. We don't decorate the houses. We don't give gifts. Even the florists have not found a way to capitalize on it. <laughs> of course, it's a, it's a great weekend for the beach retreats and, uh, and the resorts. And it's a bad day for church congregations because so many want to travel. Just look around this morning and you will see what I mean. It's the end of summer. School has started, vacations are over, and it's time to get back to work. Working hard glorifies God. It's one way that we fulfill our purpose in our life. In our culture, we thrive on perpetual momentum, certainly and constantly keeping busy and trying to work and accomplish as much as possible. Under the weight of the law, we are tempted to always be doing, achieving, and trying to reach something. <coughs> God has not made us human doings, but human beings. Even from the beginning, God gave men work to do. When Jesus came to earth, God honored work. His birth was first told to working shepherds. Jesus learned to trade as a carpenter, and he chose working men as his disciples. We could just ignore it, but actually our work accomplishes and occupies much of our thinking and dominates much of our conversations. Work dictates where we will live and often determines many of our friendships. Work often influences our relationship with others. We come to church on Sunday and we are influenced by the values and commands of God. But when we go to work on Monday, okay, this week on Tuesday, we are influenced by the values and the rules of man. We are trying to live under two distinct authorities that often are in conflict with each other. Where and what is the good life? After giving a woman a full medical examination, the doctor explained his prescription as he wrote it out. Take the green pill with a glass of water when you get up. Take the blue pill with a glass of water after lunch. Then just before going to bed, take the red pill with another glass of water. And that the woman looked at the doctor and, and said, well, well, doctor, what, what exactly is my problem? And the doctor raised his eyebrows and said, you're not drinking enough water. <laughs> Americans are the most privileged and generous people who have ever lived on the face of the earth. And yet many Americans are not happy. Life expectancy has nearly doubled in the past century and continues to increase. The average per capita income has doubled since 1960. Our standard of living has risen to levels that our great-grandparents couldn't have ever imagined. For most of our history, the average home had one room for every two people. Today, there are two rooms for every one person. By any measure of affluence and health care and leisure and technology, the average American enjoys a quality of life that is beyond anyone's wildest dreams even a few decades ago. We have more of everything except maybe happiness. The percentage of Americans calling themselves happy hasn't changed since the 1950s. But those describing themselves as very happy is down and continues to decline. During the same period, the percentage of Americans and Europeans who suffer with bouts of depression have climbed to 25% and show no sign of abating. Somehow we have stopped seeing how wonderful and how good life is. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. In Philippians we read, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Maybe we need to change our focus from what we don't have to what we do have. It used to be that people did not even recognize much of the poverty they lived in. Folks looked around and saw that no one was significantly better than they were. My parents used to talk about this time that they grew up in the Great Depression. 
and everyone lived like they did. But now, now we have big screen television sets showing us beautiful cars and clothes and electronics and gadgets and new homes and new tools and new appliances and we have malls crammed with the latest of everything. The internet is filled with ads. <coughs> Businesses don't want us to be content. In fact, they may work very hard to make sure that we're not content. The problem is that the more we have, the more we want to keep everything to ourselves. Many of our sports and media stars are paid millions of dollars but go on strike for millions more. They can't possibly spend it all. And does it really bring purpose and meaning into one's life? Maybe we need to move from getting a blessing to giving and being a blessing. There is no fulfillment in self-centered living. It's only when we invest ourselves and our lives in the lives of others that we will find purpose. Jesus was the perfect example of someone who could have demanded to be served and yet chose to serve others instead. Serving others is getting our minds off of ourselves. Go visit people in the nursing homes and the hospitals. Jesus always tried to get people to change their focus from themselves to the needs around them. Life is good, but life can also be very difficult. Problems arrive, losses and setbacks occur, disaster strikes. Franklin Roosevelt once said, we hold to the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. It's not just a fantasy, but a solid future reality. In Budapest, a man went to his rabbi and complained, Life is unbearable. There are nine of us living in one room. What can we do about it? And the rabbi said, Well, you have a goat, don't you? Yes, said the man. Well, the rabbi said, Take the goat into the room with you. The man started to argue, but the rabbi said, No, no, do as I say and come back in a week. So a week later, the man came back, looking more disheveled than before. We can't stand it, he exclaimed loudly to the rabbi. The goat is filthy and it stinks. The rabbi said to him, go home, put the goat out, and then come back in a week. A radiant man returned to the rabbi a week later saying, life is beautiful and wonderful. We enjoy every minute of it now that there is no goat and there are only nine of us. It's all about perspective. This letter to the Hebrews is a very unusual piece of scripture. In fact, it's unique among all the books of the Bible. It's not a book of prophecy. It's not the story of Jesus' life. And it's not even actually a letter. Although scholars believe that it was later changed to make it look more like a letter. The letter to Hebrews is originally a sermon. One that was, read, let, was written down and later distributed. Paul's letters were written when he was away from his community. But the author of Hebrews probably knew that he was what was going on in the day-to-day -day life community. Hebrews is also considered the most elegant writing in the New Testament. Most scholars think that this book was written about 30 years after the crucifixion. And it's a window into the life of one of the earliest Christian communities. There are two images of the church. One is bumper cars. You get in your car, and then you get out and you go elsewhere. We go to church, we worship in a familiar pew, and we say a few hellos, and we head out the door for home. The second image is that of a roller coaster. We are in separate cars, but we're still all linked together. We experience the same ups and downs and the unexpected curves and in the end, we come to an abrupt stop. Everything we do on the roller coaster we experience together. Our hopes, our joys, our pains, our brokenness. We are, after all, the body of Christ. We are one in the Lord. We are the family of God. We are on a life journey, a faith journey together. We matter to God, we matter to Christ, and we matter to the Holy Spirit. We matter to one another. Others matter as well. Relationships matter. 
those between spouses, those between friends, co-workers, family, and fellow saints. This letter to the Hebrews is Christian Living 101. It's intensely practical, and it's all the things that we can do to live a good life. The practical example is about showing hospitality and generosity. It's about trusting that God will give us enough, and we will have enough to share with others. We are told to care for those in prison. We are told that people who make mistakes are still children of God and worthy of care. We are told to be the one to help those who suffer because we're all part of one family. We're called to support each other in the commitments that we make to one another. And we are warned about the love of money. We are supposed to do our best to be content with what we have. We have to remember our leaders and follow their examples. But this piece of advice is also a bit of warning to our leaders as well, that they be blameless and live holy lives. This book of Hebrews is a series of final instructions. You remember getting instructions. Things that someone called out to you as you were driving away. Things like drive carefully. Don't forget to call or text when you get home. Remember, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Look both ways. Buy low, sell high. If you get tired, stop and rest along the way. And as my dad used to say, don't take any wooden nickels. This chapter 13 of Hebrews is filled with instructions. It touches on everything from hospitality and visitation to leadership to marriage and to money. But the main thing is to keep on loving each other. There are those who have fallen on hard times. There are those who have been mistreated. There are those who have lost a job. There are those whose family have abandoned them. There are those who are addicted or mentally ill. The epistle letter for this morning reminds us that we're to get to the heart of the matter and what it means to be a Christian and to live a good life. Being a Christian means that we are to love each other, to have sympathy for those who are in trouble, to be content with what we have, and to be willing to share and to worship God with praise. Oftentimes we're judging each other instead of loving and building each other up. How did we get so far off course? Instead of turning people on to Christ, most of the time we're turning people off of Christ. How mixed up is that? A Methodist evangelist once said, love has to be seen. People do not see the love of Christ in us. I'm not sure that we're really followers of Christ. I'm not sure that we really know him. We are called to build each other up, not tear each other down. Someone once said, today is the only way one can see love is to see it wrapped up in a person. The only way to see Christ is to see him wrapped up in us. We need to become a package of love, a package of Christ. If you've ever been to a sporting event, whether it's the high school football games or whether it's the pro games or whether it's the Astros baseball, and you've ever sit way up high in the nosebleed section, you think that the players look really, really small and the playing field looks really, really huge. But if you sit in the seats that are closer to the field, you are surprised by the view that you have the view of the players and the size of the field. Our experience with Jesus can be like that. When we get close enough to experience Christ, we can see how mighty and how strong he is. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. He is unchanging, completely reliable and trustworthy. The good life is about God and people. In the good life, we must be still and still moving into a deeper communion with God, with Christ, and with one another. Love is giving for the world's needs. Love is sharing as the Spirit leads. Love is caring when the world cries. And love is compassion with Christ-like eyes. Now that is a good life. Amen?